You got to remember, this show isn't for left or right. It's for reasonable. And I try to expose the game everywhere I see it. We did it with Meadows and those texts about the poison in the party system. Nancy Pelosi offering President Biden some very interesting advice in 2020, saying, quote, don't go too far to the left. We didn't get here in the majority by going to the left. And I can say that as a left wing San Francisco liberal. Let us win. OK, she's right. So why are so many in her party so angry? Let's discuss this and how to get better with former presidential candidate, founder of the Forward Party, book by the same name, Forward, Andrew Yang. Good to see you, brother. Thank you for being with us. It's great to be here, Chris. I was in that race. I remember Joe Biden uh, in 2020. And I'm shocked that people are shocked by Nancy Pelosi's words to him because that, that's exactly the kind of thing people would say behind the scenes. Because that's where the core of the country is. Center, maybe a little left on social issues, center a little bit right on fiscal issues. That's why, in the general, people always race back towards uh, where regular people are after primaries where they have to prove it, how extreme they are. Well, even within the Democratic primary, no one saw Joe Biden as the liberal firebrand. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, the lefty. I mean, and he beat uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren within the party. The balancing act that Nancy Pelosi is describing is that there's a tension between appealing to folks in the middle and independents and moderates and then, quote unquote, activating the base, which is getting higher turnout among your most, uh, let's say, passionate young voters uh, or, or another group along those lines. So uh, every candidate at that level is going to have a balancing act between those two priorities. But Joe clearly uh, it was designed more around the former audience than, than the latter. He was a return to convention because of what Trump had introduced into the dialogue as extremism. Um, and that's really what wound up helping him get, he was familiar. His they basic message was a return to normalcy, yeah. let's, let, let's do away with the Trump madness. But aren't they fighting over an ever-shrinking slice of the electorate, which is fringe thinking, extreme culture warriors. I mean, don't we see that the fastest growing group in the electorate are independents, people who don't want to be Democrat or Republican? Yeah, that's what the numbers say. I mean, uh, up to 50 percent of Americans now self-identify as independents. I'm one of them. Uh, you know, the, come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> to, to, to Chris's message. Um, but when, when you look at what's driving the political narrative of the day, you know it's the folks on Twitter feeding into press accounts. Uh, and, and those points of view tend to be uh, most strongly held by about 8 percent of the population. It's just 8 percent is much more visible and prominent and gets a lot more social media engagement. Well, and magnified by the media overall. I made that mistake. When social media started to blow up, it seemed to me like a shortcut towards Vox Populi and having the voice of the people, but it isn't. It's really, really bad for journalism. I had a tweet <laughs> I had a tie for where I said, look, I think you shouldn't have journalists on Twitter because it ends up distorting your point of view as to what people think. And it's a shortcut to story writing because mm -hmm. you can be like, oh, let me go on Twitter and see what's going on. And then you can access sources. Because at that time, I was running for president. I was trying to become a source. So I was like, oh, let me be on Twitter and try to make friends with these reporters. But it, it, it really does not improve the, the quality of reporting. It's magnified a minority. They'll say, hey, Andrew, People are upset about what you said. How many people? 5,000? 50,000? You know, that's how many? And that's going to be what is the lead of a major publication? <laughs> like the main thing you have to do if, if there's like a, an episode on Twitter, which I've had a few of them, uh, is just go outside and like, uh, you know, interact with people on the street and no one knows what the heck <laughs> is going on right. like, uh, in the social media ecosystem. And it's not that they're ignorant as to their own concerns and what matters and what they value. They're just not paying attention to the game, as I call it. And that's why I've had a tactical switch. My strategy is still the same, which is I don't believe that we get to a more perfect union. I don't believe that we get to where we can be as a nation by playing a game that only benefits the parties, uh, ultimately. And whereas I used to say, oh, let's just, we got to focus on getting more parties, which I definitely think would be great for choice. But if people, people have the agency, if they stop signing up to be Democrat, to be Republican, and they are independent, I think that changes the game because you don't have the numbers, you don't have that base to electrify with divisive rhetoric. You have to play to interest. Uh, so about two thirds of young people are following your advice where they're identifying as independents. The problem though is when they show up at that ballot box, they don't have a third category to vote for. They still get stuck with the R and the D, which is why a lot of 
uh, journalists and professors try and pretend that independents don't exist. They're like, look, you're going to vote for the D or the R, you lean one way or another. So one part of it, I totally agree, is for people to raise their hands and say, look, this party's uh, they're not for me. The parties are more about themselves than, than me and my family. But then the second part is what the forward party is working on, is making it so you actually have another choice when you show up to the ballot box. Let's say you have nonpartisan primaries, multiple candidates. You can vote for whomever you want, like they just did in Nevada. Uh, and by the way, that ballot initiative is going to be on the ballot in maybe five or six more states in 2024. So first, raise your hand and say, look, I'm an independent. And second, try and make it so you can vote for an independent in, in your election. Because look, otherwise, there's no reason for them to do anything in Congress other than the essentials and investigate each other. You know, I mean, they're not motivated by progress. People aren't putting them in there. They're putting them in there to stop the other side. <laughs> so and they'll investigate each other. The, these are the numbers that the American people need, need to know and understand. The approval rating for Congress right now is 22%. Three out of four Americans not happy. The re-election rate for individual members is 94%, which is a better win rate than the Jordan era Chicago Bulls. So when you say that they don't have an interest, you're right. Like, hey, I've got a 94% win rate. All I have to do is just avoid competition, keep the system closed, make it so that 90% of the districts are uncompetitive, and then I keep my job, you keep your job, we can go at each other, but the, the people's problems never get solved. Mm. Uh, let's see if the people are uh, smelling what we're cooking. Who do you have, Dusty? You got anybody for us? I do, I do. It's not a Yang Gang person, is it? No, he's not they, a Yang Gang, but they're after. definitely smelling what you're cooking. It's okay. uh, Peter from um, New Jersey. All right, Peter, what do you got? Yes, I got I got several questions for Andrew. Actually, uh, I want to know. Too bad, it's my show. You'll have to go. No, I'm kidding. I'm, go ahead, give me I'm your best sorry. one. Well, I got to know what what's different that he has that we have right now, and how he's going to make it better. Uh, why not enough advertising and promotion of your position of your party? What would you change from the current situation? How would you go after the oil companies and their price gouging? And any thoughts on the Russian swap? Wow, there's a lot in there. Uh, so I want to talk about how we can try and make thing, things better. And you cited a, a couple of interesting uh, issues around price gouging and, and what's happening with companies. The fact is right now corporate power has overrun the two-party system. And each party will say, no, it's the other party's fault. The fact is if you're a lobbyist, you know exactly what levers to pull to make sure that nothing bad happens uh, for, for your company. So the answer is to try and rebuild the connection between us and our families and our communities and our, our legislators by doing what Chris is saying, which is get out of this two-party doom loop where like I'm in this corner uh, you're in that corner and instead make it so that we can vote for anyone of any party in the, these primaries which by the way you can make happen via ballot initiative in half of the states and the other half of the states it is possible to pass ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting and make it so that anyone can vote for anyone. Uh, but that's what the Ford Party is engaged with. We're not making an ideological argument. We're making a practical argument, which is right now we're being set against each other. We're getting pitted against our fellow Americans. And who's winning? Who's winning? Not us. The parties are winning. Media companies are winning. Social media companies are winning. But we are losing. You know... I'll end with this. One of the, look, I like Andrew. Andrew's a friend. Uh, but he's a friend in part because I believe in what he's doing. And sometimes it's a trick question to say, hey, how are your positions different? What has to matter is your principles in politics. If you know what you're about, the positions come. You got to look. My father used to call it progressive pragmatism, which is, I'll tell you what my principle is. Uh, and now let me see what the situation is. I'll tell you what to do. The prisoner swap. And, you know, that's a tough call because it's a lose-lose, by the way. You give away a bad guy like that for somebody who plays to the divisiveness in America right now, not Brittany Griner herself, but what she represents to people. And I found that to be very sad. I couldn't believe that people didn't see bringing home any American was a win. But that's where we are. But if your principles are intact... The positions will come. Right now, the principles are meaningless. That's why I'm a fan of what you're trying to do, uh, and that's why this show is for independence. I know that you're going to be taken off for the holidays. I wish all blessings to you and the family, and you are a gift to this show. Thank you, Chris, and I couldn't agree more. If it was going to bring an American back, uh, you know, you got to, to give up a, a really bad person, but... You know, it's like a freaking American, you know? You gotta, like, uh, take care of your own. If, if you leave no one behind, then that's your principle. If it's, well, I'm not gonna give away a bad guy, I won't do deals. Okay, then that's your principle. Let us know what it is, and then act on it, and we'll judge you for it at the polls. 
Take care, my brother. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much for the call. Happy holidays, Chris Cuomo Nation, Cuomo Gang. I like it. Ooh, Cuomo Gang, I like that. It's a, <laughs> it's a gang of one. But you start somewhere. All right, up next.